Prince Edward Island has four federal ridings. All of them have liberal MPs and have had for years. The last time a conservative was elected here federally was 2011. This is the boundary between the Malpec and Charlottetown ridings. In that direction is Charlottetown. It's elected liberals since 1988, but there's been four different MPs over those years. Sean Casey has held it for the past 10 years. This election may be his toughest. His conservative opponent is a well-known, popular former liberal provincial cabinet minister. In that direction is Malpec. It's a large, predominantly rural riding with several small towns, dozens of fishing villages and hundreds of farms. The riding has also been in liberal hands since 1988, but with only one MP, Wayne Easter. He's represented it for 28 years. He's decided to retire, so the seat is up for grabs. Can you come watch, can you come watch with me? It's starting. Guys, the, um, can you calm down now? Yeah, it's starting. It's starting. Okay. So we'll, we'll go up and watch. Yeah. Want to come in? Anna Keenan is the Green Party candidate in Malpec. She's invited some friends, family, and supporters to join her and her son Oscar to watch the election call. Oscar's always asking me, did you win the election yet? Did you win the election yet? The election has not even started. It's not even started yet. It's starting today. It's starting today. Keenan ran in the 2019 election against Wayne Easter and came second, getting just over a quarter of the votes. She's hoping to build on that support to become the island's first Green MP. Merci de vous joindre à nous ici à Rideau Hall aujourd'hui. Il y a quelques instants, je me suis entretenu avec son excellence, la gouverneure générale, et elle a accepté ma demande de dissoudre le Parlement. Les Canadiens iront donc aux urnes le 20 septembre. She has accepted his request. So. September 20th. Mm -hmm. Oh, we're ready. <laughs> a huge topic that's coming up at the doors is like the minority government has actually been working quite well and like they've got better results because they've been forced to negotiate with the other parties and so and that's the only reason they're calling the election now is to seek a majority. What do you make the election getting called in the middle of your holiday? <laughs> actually, I didn't even know there was one until I started seeing signs. There you go. Jody Sanderson is the conservative candidate in Malpec. He spent his career working in international banking in several foreign locations. He returned home to the island to raise his family. He may be a first-time political candidate, but knows where to find voters on a hot August evening. Any issues out there that I should know about? Where? Just any issues that you guys have? Yeah, no. <laughs> Yeah, if something comes to mind, why are they charging so much for the rent an apartment and all this kind of stuff? I'm into a, I operate a small business up by Dennis King. All right. By Dennis King lives. I think right now, I think there's too much money in the system. I think well, there's a there's a lot of people coming from away, and I think we've got inflation. And right now, like I, I was talking with a number of people today, the biggest challenge I think people that are getting good new jobs, say you're a fresh grad, for example, is you can't afford rent, let alone buying a buying a starter home and that's a challenge but part of that has to do with just too much money in the system right now and it leads to inflation. You, your gas has gone up, your housing prices are going up. That only goes up when there's more money around. So it is a challenge. I, I don't have the answer for you right now but I think affordable housing is a big challenge right now. I'll, I'll get a few oysters. If you're going to be a politician on PEI you need to have some specific skills one of which is how to shuck an oyster. Heath MacDonald is the Liberal candidate in Malpec. He's been a provincial politician since 2015, served as Economic Development and Tourism Minister, as well as Finance Minister. There we go. Those are go good. <laughs> Glad you enjoyed. <laughs> So there's tourists around, the and tourists. locals, and yeah. cottage goers. Everything, cottage goers, tourists. So, anyway, hopefully it keeps up like that for the next, uh, you know, few two weeks, few weeks, weeks, three weeks, and hopefully September is a good month for everybody. Yeah, yeah. Prince Edward Island. We're very fortunate. We're sitting in front of uh, a young couple uh, with a young family at their shop right here, uh, who's exporting uh, 
uh, oysters to Montreal and Ottawa now that the cities are opening up and I think we got to be alongside them to make sure that they have every opportunity to do that and to grow that business so if that's a matter of uh, looking at more exports or different markets for them <clears throat> I think that's where government plays a significant role um, they know how to do the small business thing uh, they know how to grow the oysters uh, but we have to ensure that you know our markets are markets are available around the world for them how do we increase those markets uh, you know ensure that there's appropriate or non appropriate tariffs either reduced or removed and you just you just you do everything possible to have a young family like this living in a community survive and uh, that's part of the passion i think that any politician should have it's not about me sitting here it's about Robbie and Kendra sitting here running this little business trying to survive and you do whatever you do uh, whatever it takes to make them successful. Thank you very much. My name's Anna Kane and I'm the Green Party candidate for the federal election coming up. So okay. I'm a good friend of I'm a good friend of Natalie, your mayor. So. And you've got an Australia cap on. <laughs> there you go. I'm from Australia originally. So from Brisbane. So yeah. My husband is from PEI so he roped me in and came back here. So. Hi Catherine, I feel like I, I have to introduce myself to you. I know but you left a couple of notes for me. I last, did, last I did. Election. Last time I came through Bedeck, I knocked on your door and I, I was uh, so sad that you weren't home. So. Catherine Colbeck was the MP for Malpec back in 1988. Then she became Premier and later a Senator. No, I'd, I'd be very honoured to follow in your footsteps, of course. It's, you are uh, a trailblazer, that's well, for sure. Thank so. you. You're working closely with UPEI at the moment, <coughs> I think. I'm the Chancellor there. Yes, exactly. <coughs> I'm most excited about the introduction of a satellite medical school at UPEI. I was talking about that in the last election as well as something that we need for the island. And I know that there's been conversations with Memorial about yeah. getting that to happen. But you know, if we can train more doctors who are from here, to graduate here and then stay here, I think that'll be the best. It, it's much easier than recruiting doctors from away if we can train our own people who are connected to the community. So, very well, excited about that. Well, it's something that's really needed. Yes. You know, if you look yeah. per capita, the number of doctors. Yes. This province has the lowest mm -hmm. number of capita across Canada. Yeah. And uh, I believe it's over 19,000 mm -hmm. Islanders are on the waiting list. That's right. We need a national strategy on solving many of the healthcare issues. And I mean, the lack of um, availability for doctors on PEI, there's close to 20,000 people on PEI that do not have a family doctor. Um, you know, to me in Canada, that's unacceptable. Um, we are graduating less doctors in Canada um, than we retire. Uh, new doctors are taking on less patients than many of the doctors retiring. Um, uh, that's an equation for a bigger problem as we go forward. I think healthcare and PEI really needs to be seriously looked at. I mean, um, if you look back in 2017, we had the most doctors we ever had in PEI, and there was 150,000 people lived here. And uh, now we're at 2021, we're up over 160,000 people, and we have less doctors. So, so what's there's something wrong, and uh, I think it's a... I think it's something that the provincial government and the federal government should combine their efforts on to figure out, because this is happening across the country. You know, it's not secluded to Prince Edward Island. And I think really there should be some, some real deep dives into what is going on in our medical profession. Um, and, you know, at the local level, at the federal level, I think everybody needs to come together and ensure that we're doing our utmost. And how do you feel the Liberal Party in government has handled the environmental crisis. <laughs> the the Liberal Party talks and talks a really good talk on climate change, and I, I'll give them credit for having done things like introduced a carbon tax and having uh, you know, put forward the Climate Change Accountability Act, which is is not perfect legislation, but it's it's a step forward at least. Um, but there is such a large gap between what they have done and what the science tells us that we need to do. And climate change is the defining issue for our generation. It's the issue that I've worked on professionally for the last 15 years. And it's the primary reason that I have gotten into politics. Climate change obviously is on everybody's mind. And uh, I think it's important to talk about it. I think we've come a long way in the last two and a half to three years. Uh, we were always talking about it before that, but I think the action has really, uh, with the Paris Agreement and uh, 
uh, what the federal Liberal government has, has done so far. I think it's extremely important to ensure that we keep going in that direction. And uh, because I think everybody now realizes that climate change is real. And I can tell you back as, a, as an MLA, three to four years ago, a lot of people you would talk to about climate change and they'd say, is it real? Do you think it's real? Now I think everybody realizes, yes, it's real. And we need to act and we need to act for the future. So we need to act really quickly. But we also have to remember that we got to work alongside these industries that are really being affected by it. So governments have to be there uh, to walk alongside them. So they're not going to be able to do it on their own. So we need a plan and uh, we need to continue the growth in those industries, just if it's aquaculture, if it's farming, if it's lobster fishery, manufacturing, whatever it may be. We need to be, as a government, to be standing alongside these companies and ensuring that they're getting the best innovation and technology and the best research to move forward, uh, minimizing uh, what they're doing as far as general emissions. Let me be crystal clear. Climate change is real. Aaron O'Toole has stated the same. The majority of the party has. I know it came up at the convention and it got looped into a policy of 10 or 12 different things that ended up in, in it not passing and it was, it was really misunderstood. But from my standpoint, the environment is, is one of the most important issues in the coming five to 10 years. I think, I think Aaron O'Toole gets that. I think we've seen some policies that, that have been rolled out and you will see more on the environment from the party. You're hearing the party speak about the environment. Um, and I appreciate maybe that wasn't the case in the past. Me personally, this is something I want to lead on. Um, I, I really like the strategy of the provincial government. I like incentivizing good behavior. I think penalizing bad behavior hasn't seemed to change bad behavior. Are we driving less because of a carbon tax? I don't think we are. But are we actually buying more electric vehicles and putting solar panels on our homes and, and, and doing more things that, that will help the environment? And the answer is yes. You're, you live here in Bedeck, I imagine? Yeah, I'm down at the shore. Down at the shore. Yeah, Lovely. Yeah. Beautiful spot. So. Yeah. Um, well, I hope you... Thank you very much. Good luck. <laughs> we need some young women. Yeah. <laughs> That's for sure. I, I get that a lot at the doors. People yeah. want to see more women in politics yeah. and young women in particular. So yeah. I think it's time for Definitely. a generational change, a yeah. gender change in our representation, and a party change right. as well. I think people really didn't want this election right now. Exactly. I think there's a bit of that. But um, I think now that it's called, I think those that want change, I think are glad it is called. And it's, well, let's get on with it. and. Um, I think we've got an opportunity for the Conservative Party, I think. It's a long time coming. We've done the same old thing for so long. In this, years. Particularly <laughs> in this riding, it's time for a change. Well, I think, you know, if uh, I, you know, my, I have a track record and people can view that at any time, obviously, being in this business for a number of years. And uh, the opportunity arose when Wayne Easter decided not to run. And, you know, I pondered the idea of moving. Uh, to federal politics if I could and uh, so my wife and I it was a family decision that I decided you know what maybe it is time to uh, take a shot at this and see what I can do I I think I have the uh, the skills and the ability and the and the desire to uh, do as much as I can for Malpec and the people of PEI. That one is an interesting one because it's an open riding and anytime you don't have an incumbent it's really sometimes hard to tell how people might flip um, and Heath McDonald was a liberal uh, cabinet minister under Wade McLaughlin. He didn't have as much time under his belt as, as, um, as Doug Curry did, but he um, held some pretty key portfolios, um, most of the money portfolios. He was finance minister, he was economic development minister, so there would be a lot of people who have benefited from some programs that he would have run. Um, but I do think that... Um, just given the history of the ridings in PEI always sort of leaning toward liberal in the last couple of decades, it'll be really difficult for some of the other um, people that are running against uh, Heath McDonald or the liberals in general, uh, just to kind of differentiate themselves, get their voices heard, get their faces and names out there um, so that, you know, people have a chance to, to think about another choice in this election. Right. It's only a couple of days since the election call, but there's starting to be evidence a campaign is underway. Signs are going up at key locations. Only Liberals and Conservatives have candidates nominated at this point. 
Campaign headquarters are being set up, but for most people out for a stroll along the boardwalk, it's the summer sun that has them turning out in their finest garb. These longtime friends may be sharing a bench, but they don't share the same opinion on the election. I believe, dear, in my own heart that it's too close to when school starts and parents are getting themselves organized to get the kids to go back to school, Mr. Trudeau should take a little more time and think about things before he does them. Uh, with the trouble we're having with COVID and everything else, I think uh, not much thought went into this. they got to have it sometime. Why not now? He thinks he can win, he calls an election now. You can't blame him for that. Because we have a minority parliament that has grown absolutely, entirely dysfunctional. Uh, we have a global pandemic uh, that has required a massive rethink, a massive investment, and now a massive reset. Uh, this is absolutely the right time uh, to go to the people to say we require a new mandate in order to build back better in, in a parliament where people are committed to working for Canadians and not preoccupied with par partisan games. I mean, to be honest, it's, this is a snap election. Uh, it's in, the, in the, the dog days of summer. Um, it's a short election, 36 days. Um, you know, the feedback I'm getting at the door, people are surprised. Um, they're not happy uh, that there's an election. Uh, a lot of people feel that there's other more important pressing issues um, at this point in time. But um, you learn very quickly in this business that there's things that you can control as a candidate, which is my total focus, and there's some things that are completely out of my control. This is basically the area in red, more or less, the area that Doug represented uh, when he was a provincial cabinet minister. Casey knows he's in for the toughest fight of his political career. He's always won his riding handily, but Curry is well known and the provincial district he represented overlaps with Casey's federal riding. Okay, so, so what we're going to do here, guys, is to, this, is the, uh, this is the overall map of the city and obviously districts yeah. so obviously the objective is to get uh, obviously to as many doors and as many as many touch points uh, as we possibly can obviously our focus will be identifying our support and most importantly getting uh, the vote out so it was um, a little frustrating stressful mm. yeah. the tourism industry has been seriously affected by the pandemic and although there are signs of recovery as travel restrictions are eased a new problem has arisen so has it picked up for you it has picked up yeah. um now again we're short staff and can't find anybody is that right yeah nobody wants to work right. last weekend i i talked with three individuals who are long-standing uh, business owners in the community and it's uh it's very, very frustrating to talk to them about what they're experiencing, uh, long-standing family businesses, and they can't find labor, they can't find work. Um, if you look at today, August 17th, one of the most popular restaurants, the Blue Mussel in Rustico, basically announced on Facebook that they're closed for the day in the middle of August, prime tourism time, because they can't find staff. There's something wrong with that picture. There's right now a, a comprehensive consultation process going on to, to basically to say we've learned a bunch of things during the pandemic. How, how can we make it better? But we see, you know, there's signs out there of businesses saying, well, because of that, mm -hmm. nobody wants to work. And you're causing laziness. Uh, you know, for those who say that we've spent too much during the pandemic, um, I shudder to think where we would be if we hadn't spent it. We haven't had time to study the best way to roll it out. We haven't had, uh, we, we haven't had the luxury of putting the integrity measures up front. And if that means that the abuse is, is uh, more widespread than it would be under a, a program that has been in place for 20 years, that's a risk that we have to be prepared to accept to make sure that people don't wind up on the street. So, um, so I accept the criticism that the programs aren't perfect, uh, but I will, uh, what I would say is to a fault, they've been well-intentioned. Another area experiencing labor shortages is construction. It's booming in Charlottetown, but there's still a serious issue with affordable housing. Not everyone can afford the rent or the mortgages. 
the federal government is back in the housing business in a major way. The fact is that we can't keep up. We haven't been able to keep up. The, the, the housing uh, crunch in Charlottetown isn't something that arrived overnight. Uh, quite frankly, in many respects, we've become a victim of our own success. We've become a victim of our own success in the retention, in the in the attraction and retention of immigrants, um, in the strength of the economy, um, in the um, the challenge that we have with respect to keeping construction workers. Uh, so all of these things have conspired against us to the point where the, the demand greatly exceeds the supply. So that's $65 million, don't get me wrong, it's a significant investment, um, but there's a lot more to do. It's an issue that is, is, is top of mind here in Charlottetown. So, and it's something that I'm, I'm very concerned about. Obviously, the father of two young daughters, 22 and 20, my vision and hope for them is that they'll have the ability to affordably rent or and eventually uh, be a homeowner someday. So um, big issue. And uh, what I've seen at this point in time, I'm confident in the, the strategy and the initiatives and the investment that, uh, that the Conservative Party of Canada uh, will be making and the fact that they recognize it as a, as, a, as a real issue here, not only in Charlottetown, but across the country. As with the Malpec riding, health care is a significant concern for Charlottetown. Voters in both ridings use the Queen Elizabeth Hospital for most serious issues, but it is stretched to the limit. Health care is 100% entirely delivered by the province and partially federally funded. So the levers available to the federal government, quite frankly, are, are, are quite limited. It's, it's spend more money, try to um, get side letters signed in, in order to ensure that the money gets gets put in, in, the, in the right places. Um, one specific thing that has been done just in the last week is that PEI has been identified as a, uh, as a pilot uh, testing ground for PharmaCare, so a $35 million investment over the next four years to increase the size of the formula, formulary and, and decrease the co-pays. But it isn't going to solve the manpower problem that we have. Let me be clear, this manpower problem is not unique to Prince Edward Island. This is something that is right across the country except in the major centres. Um, the only real power that the, that the Feds have is to direct more money and hope that that will make a difference in terms of uh, how it's prioritised, how it's spent, what strategies are used to attract people. Well, first of all, I'd, uh, I challenge that comment because the federal government has a role in provincial health care. Uh, the federal government makes contributions to all provinces uh, in respect to health transfers. Um, you know, right now, when we began publicly funded health care, it was based on 50 cent dollars. Obviously, I spent approximately seven years at the federal, provincial, territorial tables. Uh, I believe that the federal government does have a role in, in health care, particularly uh, with our demographics in this country. Uh, right now there is transfers that come to the province. Um, I would like to see that relationship be redefined. Obviously uh, that money that comes to the province is money that comes from the public purse. So I believe that the federal government does need to have uh, a role in those conversations. And that's an area that I'm extremely passionate about. I feel very strongly that um, the alignment between the federal government and provinces um, is very, very important looking forward uh, in how we, how we engage in discussions on health care. Uh, there's no secret, the, 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 the premiers in this country have been very adamant uh, in demanding increases in health transfers. So I'm, I'm looking forward to um, our platform and what we're going to be looking at in respect to addressing health transfers. So uh, it's an area that's uh, very, very important to me and it's very important to the uh, residents here in Charlottetown. Because PEI is an island made of sandstone, climate change has the potential to dramatically impact the coastline. Some predictions have parts of Charlottetown underwater within 50 to 100 years. Well, climate change is real. Um, obviously, the Conservative Party of Canada has presented a very, very thorough uh, climate change plan. We'll continue to present that and talk about that during the campaign. Climate change is real. Climate change for me, particularly growing up in Charlottetown, 
uh, raising my family. Um, with climate, uh, the impact of climate change, we know the impact on our province as an island. And I'm extremely committed and passionate about our role and what my role can be as a member of parliament with our, our federal party as we continue to, to drive policy, um, um, evolve the economy to a green economy and support uh, industry and sectors and hold them accountable. Uh, we've got a big job to do. We've got one planet. Um, there's no secret uh, that um, right now uh, with uh, what's going on in British Columbia, uh, with the drought in, in Saskatchewan, with the, the rising sea levels here in the region in Atlantic Canada, it's real. There's no question that it is the really the existential um, issue of our time. There's no question about that. Um, there's, there's so much more to do. Uh, there's a very robust plan. I can tell you that uh, I served as parliamentary secretary to Jonathan Wilkinson. And when you talk about the reason why people got into politics, he got into politics uh, to, to, to tackle climate change. He, he would be another person. I would suggest that it was a terrible financial decision for him, but his, that's where his heart is. Um, and when you look at the, the plan that has been rolled out, when you look at the investments that have been committed to, I mean, he has the year and, and, uh, and the commitment of the Prime Minister and, and of the Cabinet. So I am optimistic that, uh, that we will be able to, um, to tackle climate change. I'm confident in the team that's there. I'm confident in the plan that's been laid out. And I guess I'm, I'm confident in, in the commitment. Everyone gets it. I think it's always difficult to, to uh, defeat an incumbent. So I think that Sean Casey probably isn't feeling too concerned uh, except for maybe the fact that he's got a, an ex-provincial Liberal cabinet minister as his, as his uh, political rival this time. I think the fact that he ran for the Liberals before and was such a key member of the Liberal cabinet under Robert Giz um, will be a big challenge for him in terms of trying to differentiate himself from Liberal policies. Uh, especially since in PEI, the provincial and conservative parties don't tend to have a lot of difference. It's really just really just colors sometimes and where you live and sometimes you know family history and so on but um, and so but in but running for the conservatives federally I think that Doug Curry could have some challenges in terms of some of the federal policies that come out of the conservative party and how they resonate in this province and how and trying to convince Charlottetown residents that he can still be the same Doug Curry that they knew when he was a provincial minister uh, but under a potential, an, an Aaron O'Toole government.